say that today's discussion is a part of the, that one's no good, so that one can go, part of the Relationship with God series. And the subject of this one is uh, a burning desire for God. And it's really going to be about developing a burning desire for God, really. There's some background noise in that sound system, isn't there? All right, that's the subject of our discussion today. Now, the material, um, some of the material that I'll be discussing today is actually on the website that you can download and read. And uh, so the website, just for your reminder, is www.divinetruth.com. And uh, I need to turn one of those things down a bit, I think. And uh, under the downloads, I think it's, um, um, I think it's under free downloads, there's a Divine Love Documents. There's a section called Divine Love Documents. And under the section Divine Love Documents, This document exists. Uh, it's called A Burning Desire for God. And it's down on there as a PDF document if you want to download it and read it. Didn't ask my standard, how are you today? <laughs> how are you today? Yeah. How'd you find yesterday? Yeah, enjoy yesterday? That's good. The best one. <laughs> it's hard to say which one's the best one. The, the beauty of divine truth is every bit of divine truth you hear just sort of embellishes the divine truth itself, doesn't it? Like it's like, like if you go back and listen to old ones again, you see, wow, that's pretty good still. You know, like <laughs> that's the way the divine truth hits your soul. And uh, it's just one, I, like I often feel how wonderful it is to, to, to have a knowing of the information that God gives us. It's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. And, and that's part of the thing that can help you develop a passion for God, uh, a, a burning desire for God. So what I'd like to do, the, the reason for this discussion today is that for many of us, um, Having a burning desire for anyone is a bit of a scary thing, isn't it? Because a lot of times what we feel in relationships on the planet is that when I have a burning desire for another person, a lot of times we start worrying about that means putting myself in control of the other person. So the other person can now control me because if I, and particularly if I have a burning desire for them and they don't have any desire for me, that can be a source, uh, it feels like that can be a source of great unhappiness. It's not a truth, of course. Um, most of the time, many of our so-called burning desires are really needs and not desires. In other words, most of what we think are desires are actually addictions. Mm. So that's something that we need to bear in mind. So let's look at the subject of addictions first. An addiction is something that when you don't receive it, you feel hurt, sad, resentful, angry, or rageful about, or frustrated or annoyed about. So whenever we have the emotions of hurt, rage, anger, resentment, uh, 
or you could say basically any painful emotion is an indicator that we're actually in an addiction rather than in love. Right. So quite often we go, oh, I'm so in love with this person and they're so in love with me, but the instant they do something that triggers one of these kind of emotions, we then go, boy, I hate their guts, you know, like, you know, we have a tendency of swinging from one extreme, if you like, to the other. And the reason why that happens is because we're actually not in a place of love in that particular relationship anyway at that moment. What we're in is a place of addiction. Now, you cannot have addictions for God and expect them to be met. You can have addictions for people and certainly get them met. And so what often happens in a relationship is we have one person, myself, who is full of addictions and expectations of, upon the opposite gender, and then I have the, my partner, let's say it's Mary, who is full of addictions and expectations about the opposite gender, and while I meet Mary's addictions and expectations, and Mary meets my addictions and expectations, we have what is called a very happy relationship. <laughs> and of course we will have a seemingly happy relationship under those conditions. So I'm meeting her addictions and expectations and she's meeting mine and we're happy. We're very happy. But, but the issue is this. As one person begins to grow and change, they then will begin to recognise the addictions and expectations within themselves that are out of harmony with love. And so they will stop giving certain things to the other person because to give those things would be out of harmony with love. And so let's say Mary stops giving to me the things that I have expected and been addicted to in our relationship. Let's say that happens. Now when that happens, I'm still giving the same things to her, but she stopped giving them to me. What's going to happen is that is going to bring up, because it's addictions and expectations, it's going to bring up painful emotions in me. And then I'll feel hurt and I'll feel rageful or angry or resentment, or I'll go numb or I'll feel like I've got to leave the relationship, she doesn't care for me anymore and all those kind of things. I'll actually even believe she doesn't love me anymore even though she might still love me. In fact, she might love me more than she did before. Because you see, while we're in the process of giving each other our addictions, we're actually not in a very loving space. What we're doing is I'm helping my partner, right? I'm helping her not have her relationship with God by filling her with her, fulfilling her addictions. Because while she has her addictions, she is not going to have her relationship with God intact. She's not going to eventually become at one with God. And while she's fulfilling my addictions, she is preventing my relationship with God. So my relationship with God then becomes very difficult to, to establish and have a desire for because I'm getting all of these addictive emotions met by my partner. And then when one of us stops, due to our own growth, stops meeting the other one's addictions, whenever we feel these emotions of hurt, rage, anger, resentment, all those kind of emotions, that's a very good indication that actually we have been in addiction all of this time. All of this time, whatever it might be. It might be five years, ten years, it might be fifty years of marriage that you've been in addiction all that time and had a so-called happy relationship. And you so, so after a while you start seeing actually that while one, when one person begins growing, emotionally growing, and recognising new facets of love that they've never seen before, they will no longer meet the same, the same addictions in the other person. Very recently, there's a channeling that uh, we've placed on the internet recently, uh, that you can download under the channel contemporary messages section. And it was a channeling I did with uh, Monica uh, with some spirits who were the founders of the oneness movement here on earth. And 
The male and female spirits uh, who were the founders of the oneness movement were living in the sixth dimension of the spirit world. And what happened is over a period of time from one of their, um, one of their what they called their disciples in the spirit world, they learnt about the divine truth. They both decided they wanted to investigate more about the divine truth recently. And I'm going on and off again. I don't know why this is happening. But, um, I've got another mic up here, but I'll just persist with it for a little and see how we go. And so what happened is that uh, we, we talk with this couple about what was going on for them emotionally now. And what was happening is while they were in the sixth fear state, the woman in the relationship had the, dominant, uh, had, had the dominant control over the relationship. So they were very, very happy in their expression of natural love towards each other when, and, and perfectly at peace in their relationship and had quite a few hundred years in that space. And then what happened is they went down to the third sphere and started dealing with their emotions about that. And as soon as they went to the third sphere, the man in the relationship realised that the reason why they've been happy all this time was because he was doing whatever she wanted. Right? And so he stopped doing whatever she wanted because she, he knew that this was out of harmony with love, uh, actually. And so what happened was he progressed to the fourth sphere, the fourth dimension, and she remained in the third and she became very angry and upset with him. And she was saying to me that she feels that he doesn't love her anymore. So the addiction was so strong that when he stopped supplying the addiction, she believed that he didn't love her anymore. Does that make sense? And as a result of that, she was thinking, well, she was very confused because she'd always believed they were soulmates and she'd always felt that uh, they had a deep connection and she'd always been very, very happy with that connection. And so she was quite confused, but also very angry. And she was expressing her rage with me about uh, what, what happened and how, how come they'd lived all this time in the spirit world not having these emotions. And then as soon as they get in contact with the divine love path, all of a sudden they've got all these emotions that they hadn't felt for many hundreds of years. Like, how is that? How does that work? And this is how it is for many of us on earth too is that we're in these relationships on earth that are actually based on addictions rather than, than a loving relationship. So what I want to do firstly in today's discussion is talk about what emotions or longings are required to have actually a loving relationship from a person to another person. And then what we will do is we'll impose those sort of, if you like, guidelines about love that we learn and we'll reflect upon those in terms of our relationship with God to see how they are very, very similar to each other. Does that make sense to everyone? So if we look firstly at how to perfect our love with each other, and in particular if we look at a partnership where, where there's a, a, a relationship, if you like, between a couple, and how love would flow between the couple, and we define how that love would flow. So let's do that first. And we'll call this section maybe how love, how natural love. Remember, natural love is the love that comes from within yourself. So how natural love flows. Now, who's, who's never met me before? Is there anyone here who hasn't met me before? Is there anyone here who hasn't yet had a personal conversation with me? Would one of you like to come up with me now and have a personal conversation? <laughs> come on. So this is a microphone. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Does it work? Yeah. It works. Yeah. So what was your name? Suzanne Woodridge. Suzanne. Yeah, Suzanne. And how long have you been coming along? Suzanne? Five months. Five months? Yep. And, and uh, like, what's been your background, Suzanne? Like, where were you born? Switzerland. Switzerland? Yeah. And when did you move over to Australia? 20 years ago. Yeah. I arrived in Sydney on the 12th of August, 1990. Yeah. 
uh, came to the Gold Coast on the 15th and never left. Okay, <laughs> so you like the Gold Coast. Oh, this is the best place for uh, those guys. <laughs> I just convinced myself a yeah. couple of weeks ago. It's a bit warmer than Switzerland. Oh, brighter. <laughs> More, yeah, everything is just better. Yeah, although I love the mountains in Switzerland. I was there recently. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, but you got to go over the, the, the um, clouds. Yeah. I mean, there is a beautiful feeling if you stand on your skis yeah. on top of the mountain. Yeah, it is a beautiful <laughs> <the> sky, feeling. sky, yeah. <laughs> and then the world is yours. Yeah. But you can get the same feeling at the beach. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. No worries. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so you're married? Yes, I am. And you got children? Yes, I do. Yeah. I have two, two kids. And you got married here in Australia or back at home? No, I, I was the one who suggested, oh, well, if we really got, you know, bugger off, maybe we should get married first. Ah, okay. And then it was quiet for about three months. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so you sat on we, that. Got, we got married before we left to, yeah. um, to America, actually. Ah, okay. So he sat on that for three months. Well, we both did, <laughs> <laughs> after being together for seven years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And uh, how did you come to find about, the, found about these groups and stuff? How did you find well, out? Well, that was really funny. I, well, I went to a party and was sort of exhausted and found Elizabeth, or yeah. Elizabeth found me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, she said, and we had a conversation, and I said, look, Australia is the best thing ever, ever happening to me. And I really, and, and I got everything I've ever, ever dreamed of. And I'm really ready to give something back to the community. Right. And maybe I would like to work with the homeless or whatever. And she said, well, I think you and I have a lot more in common than you think. Yeah. <laughs> can I come for a coffee? I said, of course I can come for a coffee. A day later, she was, uh, you know, on my veranda telling me about you. <laughs> you poor lady. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sort of. <laughs> so, uh, two days later, I um, joined, um, I, I went to Pascal's meeting for yeah. the first time. Yeah. And there she came with 50 DVDs in her hands. Right. She gave you the whole lot? <laughs> the whole lot. <laughs> 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 And now you've been sitting at home, locked in your room. Pretty much, pretty much. It changed my life, I yeah. can tell you that much. Um, and what have you been doing uh, all this time up to this point? What, what kind of work or you've been doing or you've been... Well, we, uh, we were very lucky that we were allowed to come into this country because of our profession. We are mm. both from the hotel industry, ah, okay. both tra were trained chefs yeah. and um, did the hotel management school. And that way it took us about two months yep. and we had to stay in our passport. Um, uh, two months after um, we had the, you know, we had the allowance to come, I found out I was pregnant. Uh -huh. Oh my God, what am I doing now? Yeah. But we came anyway <laughs> yeah, yeah. against every, every common sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then after three years, Staying and ha having the two children, uh, staying on the Gold Coast, we decided to uh, start a business. Mm -hmm. So we started a business from scratch. Um, me, yeah, back in the kitchen in Australia, with the whole setup, gave us a chance to do that because the children were so well looked after in kindy, and yeah, everything just worked out for us awesome. in, in any in any sense of the way. Yeah. So what was your name again? Suzanne. What was your last name again for everyone? So. <laughs> Wolfridge. Wolfridge. Yep. So you've met Suzanne. <laughs> Say hello to everyone, Suzanne. I oh, know it's a bit scary out here. <laughs> um, but you may have noticed something in this interaction. What have you noticed in this interaction? Can we get a microphone, uh, perhaps? Uh, over, yeah, just there it is. There. Um, if you keep your hand up. Yep, and we'll go. It was a, <coughs> it was a, a one-way interview, as it were. Not that that is a, has any connotation of good or bad. Yeah. It's simply an observation about the dynamic. So what so what is flowing here between us? Can you see what's flowing here between us? Am am I open to actually Sus Susan telling me these things? Do you feel that I'm open to? knowing Susan. Do you feel Susan's open to knowing me at this point? Not really, hey. What's the, what's the biggest emotion that was driving it that you never asked me anything? 
Well, I watched 50 DVDs and know more than you think. <laughs> so one emotion is that, is that you think you know me from the DVDs? Um, I have, yeah. Or maybe I'm also embarrassed to ask you certain okay, things. Okay, so now, which, yeah, so now the, can you see spot. how the fear puts you on a spot? Does that yeah, make sense? Enough. Can you see how the fear blocks an interaction between the two of us that's fully love-based? Can you see that? So I, I didn't have any fear about knowing you, and so I can inv uh, invite. And of course, I'm at an advantage because I've been up here before, and you haven't. So that's you know, there's all these advantages. But what I'm trying to illustrate to everyone that if I'm open to knowing a person, I will actually be interested in that person's life. I want to know a bit about the background of the person. I want to know what's going on for them, what what drew them to us meeting. Uh, in this way, and also a bit about their background. Where did they, how did they get here? Where did you come from? All those kind of things. And I'm, what I'm trying, what I'm doing is I'm open to feeling Susan. Does that make sense? Open to feeling her. But on the other end, because of the situation you were put in, in this, in this case, um, there was not the same openness to feeling me and feeling what I was feeling in that interaction. Does that make sense? Fair enough. That's what I'm getting at. And can you see that that straight away creates a dynamic where one person is open to receiving and asking questions and, and, and the other person is being drawn out. But it's not yet a complete relationship, is it? It's only going to be a complete relationship under what circumstances? Well, the circumstances are that I would have to firstly want to know this beautiful person. So I will want, I will want to know her then she will be, ha, need to be open enough to want to be known. Does that make sense? Which Susan was, of course, which is fantastic, because you, 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 know, you were able to tell yourself, whereas some people would come up here and I'd ask them a question, oh, I don't want to talk about that, and I don't want to talk to you about that, and that's being really quite closed down about being open to being known. Then on the opposite end, Susan would want to have a desire to know me. Does that make sense? And, and, and get to know me. And also, I would then have to be open to being known by her. Can you see that? And then this would actually be more of a, a sort of a friendship-based relationship, wouldn't it? Can you see that? There'd be a flow between the two of us. Okay. Thank you very much, Susan, for illustrating that for me. No and it's lovely to meet you. So, um, so what, I'm show what was demonstrating there is how natural love flows. Y you can actually see it in action in almost every interaction. And this is why at times you walk into a new person or a person that you know and you come away feeling quite unfulfilled. Because at times what's really going on is you are there feeling certain things for them that you can also at the same time feel that they don't feel for you. And you are also open to certain things from them that you can at the same time feel they are not open to those same kind of things from you. And can you see how that blocks the flow of feelings between each other? Even, we're not even yet talking about love. We're talking about just even blocking the flow of feelings towards two people. So what we want to do is actually look at how this love flows between us as individuals. What we want to do is look at that. And once we look at that, we can then start examining, examining how love would perhaps flow between us and God. Does that make sense to everyone? So what we want to do firstly is examine this flow of love between an individual. So here we go first, we've got one person. Now let's say this is now going to be a much closer relationship. In other words, we're going to eventually be married and have a partnership and have children and everything else, right? So we, the whole kit and caboodle is the same, perhaps, goes. So let's say it's a male and female relationship um, and maybe they're even soulmates, right? And they don't know at the point of the first meeting, obviously, would they? And most of the time they probably wouldn't know because of different emotions that they have uh, about themselves and about the opposite gender. But the first thing that has to happen is, so let's call this person number one and this person number two, or perhaps it's better, because labels are never very nice, that are numbers, let's call this guy 
Joe, and this gal, Sally. Okay. And Joe sees Sally from across the room. Right. And, uh, and given Joe's injuries, if they're like mine, he would actually find that Sally didn't notice him at all across the room. No, no, no. <laughs> but uh, so Joe sees Sally across the room. And, and Joe has a feeling in him that develops. I'd like to know that person. Can you see first, there has to be a desire inside of Joe before he'll do anything. Can you see that? So Joe needs to desire to know Sally. So let's, let's put it like that. Firstly, this is just to get to know each other. Joe must desire to know Sally. Does that make sense? That's, that's a must, isn't it? Before anything can happen, that has to happen. And the same, like this is before one of them must have a desire to know the other before anything can happen. Because otherwise the two will just walk past each other and nothing will happen at all. Isn't that the case? One of them has to start. But then Sally would also have to be, must be open to being known. Can you see that? So Joe goes up to Sally and says, look, I'd really like to get to know you. And she says to back to him, what would I want you to get to know me for? I don't want you to know me. Get lost. <laughs> well, Sally's blocked to being known by Joe, isn't she, under those circumstances? She doesn't want Joe. She's blocked. So she has to be actually open to being known by Joe before there'll be some kind of, even some kind of flow happen. Then, for a relationship to develop, Sally, at some stage, will need to, and this will have to also be a must, desire to know Joe. Isn't that true? Because if, if Sally doesn't ever desire to know Joe, and she just wants to be known by Joe, and she likes Joe having a desire for her, that's a very one-sided relationship, isn't it? And who's going to feel quite unfulfilled in that relationship? Probably Joe, right? In the end, isn't he? He's going to get into this state where he feels like, what's the point? Like, this is a very one-sided relationship. This is not a relationship anymore. This is just me pandering to a woman's desire to feel special or something like that. Can you see that? For the relationship to develop in purity, Sally must also have some feelings and she must have a desire to know Joe. And also, Joe must be open to being known. Now that's just for them to have a what you would call a friendship that's harmonious with love. We're not even talking about a relationship yet, are we? We're just talking about a friendship harmonious with love. Now, can you see, to enter those states already requires the confrontation of quite a lot of emotions. Can you see that? Like, for example, if the woman is not open to being known, then what emotions will have to come up for her? She'll have to look at the reasons why she's not open to being known, why she, why she doesn't want to be open and vulnerable. And the man would have to do the same if he's not open to being known. So, you know, this is why many women complain, oh, he never tells me anything about how he's feeling. Right? And many men then just say, well, that's because you don't want to know how I feel. And, and a lot of, there's a lot of truth in these statements that go on between the genders. Right? There is a lot of truth in them. And the truth is that when we iron them all out, we'll get to the stage where we'll at least have that. When we have that, when we have those four conditions met, then there is, an option, then there is the ability to have a relationship, is there not? A friendship relationship, all I'm talking about here. Nothing else, just a friendship at this point. 
can you see for a relationship develop, to develop, there's got to be even more desires on both parts. That there's got to be a desire to be sexually interested in Sally. And then Sally's got to be open to being sexually known. And then Sally must desire to sexually know Joe. And then Joe must be open to be sexually known. Can you see there's... So as soon as a sexual relationship would develop, as long as those four things are happen, I mean harmonious with love, as long as those four things occur. Can you see an emotional relationship would develop when Joe desires to emotionally know Sally? And when Sally is open to being emotionally known? And all, all of those things still apply. We could apply them in every aspect of the relationship. Can you see? Those basically, basically those four rules. And as long as I am open to being emotionally known and my partner is open to knowing me emotionally and she is emotionally open to being known and I'm open to knowing her emotionally, now we can have an emotional relationship. But if, if, if the only way you want to be known is by your deeds rather than your emotions, then you will only have an intellectual relationship. Won't you? Isn't that the case? Can you see how these rules apply in every single situation pretty much in a relationship. And if you look at any pain that occurs in a relationship, it is usually because one of these things are not being met and the other person demands that they should be met. That's the creator of pain. So if I have a demand, if Joe goes up to Sally with a demand that Sally allows him to know her, now there's going to be pain in the relationship. Because does love demand anything? No. Doesn't she have the choice? Yes. So if I'm demanding it of her, now I am being out of harmony with love and every time I am out of harmony with love, there will be pain. So every time in any relationship there is pain, I know that one or both of us are out of harmony with love. So that's the basic principle about love. And the truth is that uh, if we truly love, there is no pain. Any relationship. Right. Now that's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because how many of us experience pain in relationships? Most of us all of our lives, right? Which is telling us actually that all of those relationships have had a lack of love in them at some point. Does that make sense? There's been addictions, codependencies and so forth and not harmonious with love. But what we're trying to illustrate here is how natural love, how the love that comes out of the heart of a human, which is what we would call natural love, the love that's inside of you that you can develop, actually flows between people. And can you see how much it's based upon desire? And it's not even based upon whether you know the person or not. It's based upon whether you desire to know the person or not. Can you see that? That's how love grows, through this passionate desire inside of yourself to know another person. Right? And so love, the flow of love, is very, very dependent upon this desire that needs to develop. Now, how do you develop desire? That's, that's a very interesting question, isn't it? Because a lot of times we just feel some kind of attraction, don't we, to another person. And often those attractions are based around emotional addictions. That's why we feel the attraction in the first place. And that's not love or desire. Right? So a lot of times we have a tainted desire to know the other person. And oftentimes the other person may have a tainted desire to be known as well. And you can see why they might have all sorts of emotional addictions too. So, so for example, if I have a desire to be known, it might be because when I was younger, I wasn't ever taken any notice of, I wasn't treated like I was very special, I was pretty much ignored most of my life, and now I go around and there's this emotion coming out of me, please know 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 me, you know, like this is really incessant demand coming out of me that somebody else knows me. And then somebody in the universe is going to respond to that huge base, soul-based coming out of me, please know me, if they have 
a feeling in them that they want to know you, they want to know you, that's love, they want to know you, that's what love is, and I want to know someone, I want to know someone, I want to know someone, I really want to get to know someone deep down, because my parents never let me know them at all, and so I, I just want to get to know So I'm going around, I want to know you, 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 right? And, and who's going to get together now? Well, the woman is going, please know me, please know me, please know me. And the man is going, I want to know you, I want to know you. They're going to be naturally attracted, are they not? We are so in love. Three days later, we're in the sack. You know, like, that's, that's how in love we are. It was just like, it just hit us like a ball of lightning. And wasn't, isn't love wonderful? And now we write some few songs about that, you know? Like, <laughs> now, none of this is love, of course. This is all just codependent addiction. But we think it's love when we begin. That's what we often think. But then as we work through our stuff, the man's starting to go, this please know me thing. I'm finding I'm very tired of this. This is very demanding. This doesn't feel very comfortable for me. I don't know if I will know you anymore. <laughs> right? And the woman, the woman goes, you're not knowing, wanting to know me anymore. What's wrong with you? You're something wrong with you. Like, and straight away, you can see the degradation of the relationship that's, that was created based on an addiction and is being now destroyed by people coming to see the results of their own addiction. And the results of their own addictions always result in pain. Now that's not the kind of relationship we want with God, obviously. And it's also not the kind of relationship we want with anyone else, is it? Really? We want a different kind of relationship. A different kind of relationship is one where desire grows over time due to us coming to know someone deeply. All right. Now, this is a very, very different state, and I still must have desires, but these desires, I need to work out whether they're addictive or not addictive. I need to know myself quite well, don't I, in that place. I need to know whether I do have addictions or I don't have addictions and what addictions I have and how they affect my relationships and so forth. So how do I get to know these things? Well, there's a relationship you can develop with God that will expose every single one of them. Every single one of them. And you will, in the end, have a pure desires in all of your relationships as a result. But if we look at how natural love flows, that's how it flows. But for it to begin flowing, there has to be a seed of desire. There has to be something that just triggers off desire. Unfortunately, as I've just illustrated, for most of us, it is some kind of codependent addiction that kicks off a relationship. But it doesn't have to be that way. Because you and I can have a relationship of all kinds. Like We can have a friendship, can't we? Right now we can have a friendship. We have friendships with hundreds of different people. And each one of those friendships be pure in nature, depending upon our passions and desires to know that person and spend time with that person and feel that person. Now let's go a bit further than this. When do you really know a person? I'll put to you that the only time you really know a person is when you can feel every emotion they feel. Does that make sense? So, how do I know a person when I can feel everything they feel? That's not a very intellectual space, is it? That's not about knowing, so I asked Susan, a lot of questions about where she was born, where she grew up, where she, how she cut to come to Australia and all those kind of things. They are all details. That's not getting to know her, is it, really? Because the only way I'm going to get to know her, really, is to be able to, at some level, feel what she's feeling at any point in time. So I, so I feel like when I asked the question about, or when you told me the answer about, you know, you, you proposed to your husband, basically. You put it up in the air, is the way you put it, yeah? And so basically I'd call that proposing to your husband. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and did you, f if you could feel Susan there, there was a sadness in her about having to do that. No. Yeah, see, this is, this is, 
No. <laughs> No, because... So it's talking to the mic? Yes. Is it? It's, it's on... Uh, I think it's, it's, it's all right. There you go. Yeah, okay. No, that's not true. She's going to deny this vehemently. <laughs> no, because, because we... Um, I sort of did it because that was the family expectations to do it. And because you grow up in an environment where certain things are expected from you, so you fit into that role. Mm, but see, see how you're interpreting even my statement. I wasn't <laughs> saying that you were sad with your husband. But you said I was in a sad state. Oh, no, I said there was a sadness in your comment when you made the comment. And I could feel that sadness. Oh, okay. And the sadness was about society and, and how everyone would think of you and all these other sadnesses that you feel forced into doing something. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, you know me better than I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, the truth is you can know a person better than they know themselves. If you can feel their emotions. You see, just because a person can't feel their own emotions doesn't mean you can't feel their emotions. You you notice this a lot, right, in your day-to-day -day life, don't you? Like how how somebody's in a rage and you say, "Oh, you seem pretty angry." I'm not angry. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then you talk about something and somebody changes the subject on you. And every time you try to talk about that subject, they change the subject. And you say to them, "Every time I try to talk about this subject with you, you always change the subject." No, I don't. <laughs> right? Now, often on the receiving end, we can see that, how we can see an emotion inside of a person that the person themselves can't even see. The truth is, though, that when you can feel everything other people feel, that's the time when you know them. That's the time when you know them. It doesn't mean they even know themselves. You can actually know a person without them knowing themselves. All right? And this is a very powerful... Now, how do you get to the stage where you can feel everything they feel? By feeling everything you feel. Uh -huh. That's the only way you can do it. If I'm open to all the emotions of my own flowing through me, now I can be sensitive to the emotions that are flowing through the other person. Does that make sense? And a lot of times the emotions flowing through the other person might not be that good. You know, you might, you go, see, this is the reason why we don't like doing this to a degree. Because if you can feel everything that another person feels, that might sound good when all the things they feel for you are great. But what happens when what they really feel for you isn't that great? What happens with what they feel for you is actually, no, I'm not that attracted to you, and I don't really care for you. I'm just sitting in this relationship because it feels like I have to, and religion tells me I have to, and I've been here for 25 years, and it's scary to get out of it. What's, what, what if that's the feelings they feel? That they never voiced to you and now you're open to feeling? Now that's going to be quite confronting, isn't it? Can you see how we are so tempted as a culture and as, a, as, a, 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 as the human race to deny our own feelings because we need to deny the feelings that other people have towards us? We, we try to stay away from what they feel about us and in the process, we have to shut down what we feel as a result. And so we're in this process of suppressing emotion. To actually, to actually be connected to somebody, we need to have a desire to feel what they feel. This actually is the main cause of relationship breakdown. One or both parties has no desire to feel what the other person feels at a truthful level. And as soon as that, that happens, what will happen is the relationship will begin breaking down. And so the beauty is that we need to have this feeling inside of us that I want to feel what my partner feels. I want to feel what's going on for them in every aspect of their life. How do they feel about family? How do they feel about sex? How do they feel about our relationship? How do they feel about me as a person? How do they feel about my body? How do they feel about my looks? How do they feel about our life? How do they feel about what we're desiring to create? Do they have a passion for any, every one of those things? Now, it's highly unlikely 
when we begin any relationship that any person is going to have many of those feelings. And so what we finish up doing is we detune from a lot of them to cut ourselves off from the emotions that we feel as a result of them not feeling these emotions for us. And in the process of doing that, we can no longer feel theirs either. We can no longer feel their emotions either. This is why we're of, often couples come and say, oh, we'd like to work on our relationship. No worries, you're very upset with your partner. No, I'm not. <laughs> yes, you are. I'm sorry, you are. Right down there, and I can actually describe the emotions. This is what I can feel in you. This, 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 this. And by the time you get to three or four, it's quite confronting now, isn't it? And so then anger usually is the next step that most people take. But, but the truth is that if you're open to feeling all of your own feelings, you can feel the emotions that everyone else feels, even about other people. And you can describe them. You'll get to a point in your progression, actually, that you'll be able to describe them so accurately to the person that they'll instantly get into emotion because of your description. Does that make sense? Just because all you're doing is describing how it feels, how their feeling feels to you. And it's, this is not a feeling based on reaction. So you're not angry because of... So a lot of times I notice people saying things like, oh, you're angry to somebody else. And I go, they're not angry, they're sad. Can't you feel their sadness? What you're feeling is your own response to their sadness, which is anger. <laughs> you know? But they're actually feeling quite sad. You know, quite often you see this between in a partnership where the woman might be sad and the man, every time the woman's sad, the man feels responsible for his mother. <laughs> right? so, so every time the woman's sad, he feels like he's getting attacked. He feels like he's, something's going to be demanded of him now. So instead of feeling oh, compassion for the woman's sadness and feeling like, why is she sad? What's going on? He's not feeling that. He's feeling his own emotions of, damn it, I'm so sick and tired of a, of a woman being sad around me because that means I've got to go and do something and fix it, you know. And that's all to do with his issue, issues with his mother, but he then imposes that onto the relationship. And so then he decides to detune from what the real feelings are within her. And he gets into an anger, which is actually detuning even from his own feelings in response to the feelings that she has. And this happens all the time in relationships. So, so when we have a pure desire to feel everything our partner feels, now we could say that we're really starting to feel like we want and be open to having a relationship with this person. So you notice there's already now there's been five things that have had to happen in the relationship. There's been the desire had to be for one person, from, from one person to the other, uh, in other words, like, I think the names were Joe and Sally, weren't they? So Joe and Sally, so Joe had to have a desire for Sally. Sally had to be open to Joe having a desire to, had to be open to that desire and open to being known. And Sally then had, needs to have a desire for Joe and Joe needs to be open to being known by Sally too. These are all basic things that need to happen. And then on top of that, if for this to happen at a truly soul-based relationship, they both have to be able to feel everything the other person feels and be open to feeling and have a desire to feel what the other person feels, have a desire to know what the other person feels and all those kind of things. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. So there we are, we've got... And that, once we've got that, now love will flow. And love, by the way, is a substance that you can feel into you. And this is a, it's the same between people. Love is a substance that comes out of you and can enter another person. By the way, every other emotion is also a substance that comes out of you and enters the other person if, it's a, if they allow it. So rage is another emotion with substance. And fear is another emotion with substance. And shame is another emotion with substance. And I'm going offline again. And, and, and as these emotions with substance get transmitted, if the other person is open to feeling them and receiving them, then they will enter that person and change the substance inside of their own soul. It will colorize, if you like, from, if you see it as a spirit, it colors the soul. Well, if I've got an emotion of fear, so let's say I get with all of you and I transmit my emotion of fear to all of you. Right. Let's say I do that. What you will see as a spirit 
is this emotion of greyness and grey blackness coming out of me and every one of you that's open to this fear entering you it will just enter you and wash through you and your whole soul colour will change, your whole spirit body's colour will change into grey blackness for the time that you accept this fear. And it will change what's going on inside of you. you will, it will actually trigger some of your own fears as a result. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Because obviously if I'm open to feeling fear from another person then I have got some fear inside of myself that I need to release. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. I just need to be, if I'm open to an emotion, that emotion will enter me and I'll see it change me. And it does change me. The truth is love is the same. When you are open to love entering you, the love from another person will change you. You see, a lot of us are trying to hold on to us being how we are now, hold on to us being the same. And the reality is that actually, if you want to love, the love is going to change you. So why I try to hold on to being the same? You know, it doesn't make much sense, but often we do that. So there we go. That's what we got, how, how natural love flows. Now can you see how natural love flows is very much involving two people, isn't it? It involves, it involves the giver, let's say this is the giver, the receiver and then the giver and receiver. They both have to learn to give and both have to learn to receive for love to be able to flow between two. If that doesn't occur, what will happen is the relationship will be very one-sided for a period of time until somebody recognises the codependent addictions that are going on and decides to walk away from the relationship. So until somebody recognises the pain of anything else occurring, that won't, you know, the, the, this kind of a loving relationship won't ever be established and the relationship will instead be codependent. Okay, so there's our relationship with people. Now, the beauty of our relationship with God is that God already does all of her part perfectly. Mm -hmm. right? So if we draw myself at this, on this stage, side and then we say God is an entity. So let's just conceive for a moment. We know that God's not an anthropomorphic God but let's just conceive God like this at the moment up here as our mum and dad for a moment, right? as one soul, God. Right? So there's God. And, and I want a relationship with God. Now, the beauty is that God already has everything in place for everything of our relationship to work perfectly. Everything. For example, God has a desire to know me. It actually extends beyond that. God actually already knows you. Not does she, she just have a desire to know you. She, has, she already knows you. And why does she already know you? Because she can feel all of your feelings. She knows exactly what all of them are. Does that make sense? Every single one of your feelings, your desires, your passion, every single belief system that's in you, every single thing that's there sitting inside of your soul, God already feels from you. So God's perfect in that she not only has a desire to know me, she does know me. She's already got that in place already in place. She knows absolutely every intricate detail inside of you. A lot of the times hey, we're not too fussed about that right? because, because we don't like being known every little intricate detail inside of us. We often don't even like being known to ourselves, let alone someone else, and yet God already does know me. She also has a desire To love me. That's already in place. In fact, let's go one step further again. She already loves me. She does love me. That's 
That's already in play. God's already got that happening. The other thing is that God also has a desire to be loved by you. She has a desire to be loved by all of her children, actually. So she desires to be loved by me as well. She desires my love. She also desires that I know her. She, she's allowed me to get to know her. And a lot of people go, mm, I don't really know much about God. And in a minute I'm talking about all the different ways that God has given you opportunities to know her. There's, there's millions, millions, literally millions of ways that God has given you an opportunity to get to know her. And she desires that you do know her. To know her. God has got already all of her receiving in play as well. In other words, she is perfectly ready to receive all the love that you could possibly give her. Right. So right at this moment, you've got this heavenly parent, an entity which we will call your source or your creator, God, and she has everything in play, everything in play, ready for you to have a relationship with her. Everything's ready. From her perspective, everything is ready. Right. She wants to love you, she already does. She wants to know you, she already does. She wants to feel you. She already does. She wants you to know her. Mm, does that happen? Very often. Not much really, is it? And she wants you to love her. She has a desire for you to love her. Does that happen very often? Well, a lot of people think that of God. But how can you love God and believe a heap of falsehoods about God? So, so it's sort of, like, sort of like me saying, I love Mary. And then I think Mary's this terrible person who does this. Mary's willing to murder millions of people. Did you know that about Mary? Well, that's what we often think about God, isn't it? That God's willing to murder millions of people. Right? We feel that God is a punishing God. That, like, for example, what's, the, what's the, a generalised Christian view of God? God loves me as long as I, don't, as long as I do everything right and nothing wrong. And as soon as I do something wrong, and I'm not sorry for what I've done, God's going to keep me eternally tormented forever. Even once I become sorry, I'll still never be able to get out of that place. That's the general Christian view of God. Right? Now I'm going, okay, um, God's going, okay, I don't think they know me very well. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> obviously. Now, there's God, and God's got everything in play for, to have a relationship with you. She has a burning desire to have a relationship with you. A burning desire in her. She is very emotional about her passion, about having a relationship with you. Do, do you understand that? She wants to know, not just know, but she wants to have this personal love-based interaction with you right now she and it's always been there even when you didn't want to know she was still wanting this she was wanting to have this relationship with you all this time from the moment you were created in her image she has desired a relationship with you from then on do we have a mic up there back yeah. I'm feeling a lot of fear. That's very scary for me. That somebody truly wants to love me that much. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can handle that. I, I don't know how to accept that. It's just really, it's a really scary thought. That somebody truly wants to love me that much. Because I feel like I've been wanting that 
all my life and I don't know how to accept that. Well, isn't it really that you've been wanting that all your life and you never got it and you, you feel so much disappointment about that that now you're scared to long for it? Yeah, isn't and get disappointed again. Yeah, and be disappointed again. Yeah. Well, what I'm saying is there's no need to worry about ever being disappointed again with God. Because the truth is that God's already got everything in play. God's already got everything there. And all I need is to come to see what God has already put in play for, to know me. So you're only scared because of your previous experience with love. And as long as you release that previous experience with love, what will happen is you'll be open to seeing the truth of how much God really does love and care for you. Huh? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. but it, it's a very big unworthy thing too. Yep. That, you know, no matter how hard I try, um, I won't end up with it. But, but don't you see that that itself is a belief is also untrue? Because God, God, God was feeling all of these things for you before you even began to try. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so you don't actually have to do, try before God put everything in play. God put all of these things in place ready as a relationship with you long, long time ago. You don't even have to try. You can be a person who doesn't try anything at all and God is still going to love you. Right? The issue is though that that love will not enter you mm. until certain conditions are met. And the conditions are under your control, not hers. Does that make sense? That's yeah. the only thing. The conditions of the love entering you are under your control. So she's not putting a condition on you, yes. you're placing the condition on yourself. There is conditions that need to be placed on yourself for love to enter you. And the conditions are quite obvious if you think about it. So one of your, the issue you've just exposed is the issue of when I'm afraid, what I do is I place a barrier around my own soul and love can't enter me in that place. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and if, love, if love can't enter me in that place, then God's love can't enter me in that place either. Right? And so who's, who's got the fear? It's not God, it's myself. And so what I'm doing now, so the condition of me receiving God's love would firstly be to remove the fear of being loved. Because you can see why most of us have a fear of being loved, can't you? Like when you were little and, you, and, and somebody loved you, what did it mean? It mean that you had to do what they say, otherwise you'd get a belting, generally. It, mean, it meant that you had to feel what they were feeling and be ultra sensitive to everything they're feeling and automatically make them feel better. Didn't it mean that? For most of us in our childhood, didn't it mean that? Didn't it also mean that we had to respond to every single demand of the person who loved me and do whatever they wanted? And when I didn't do what they wanted, I either got yelled at, screamed at, abused, or punished violently for not doing what they wanted. Isn't that where most of us came from in terms of a family? Now, now when you think about that, that's going to create a lot of fear in me about ever opening my heart up to being loved again. And that's not the kind of love that God is offering you. God's never offered you that kind of love. God's never been a punishing God and never will be. God's never been a God that demands anything from you. How can you give the gift of free will to somebody and then demand that they respond a certain way to it and then punish them if they don't? Is it now free will? <laughs> no, it's not. So, so you see, God's given this gift of free will. It's, it's one of the most beautiful gifts that God's ever given. And God's given this gift of free will because God wants you to live your life passionately, but God also knows that there's certain things that are going to make you very happy and certain things that are going to make you sad if you're passionate in certain directions. So if you're passionately involved in drug abuse, then eventually you're going to have a very sad life. But if you're passionately involved in other type of life that's more in harmony with love of yourself, you're going to have a much more loving life. It's just a simple matter of our choices. And God doesn't even expect you to make the right choice. That's the gift of free will. The gift of free will is a wonderful gift, isn't it? Right. 
and we need to talk more about it at another time. But can you see what I'm saying is that God has everything in play from her perspective to actually have a passionate, loving relationship with you. She already feels all of your emotions. She, she feels all of them. Whether they are what you classify as good or bad, she's feeling them. Whether they're unloving or loving, she's still feeling them from you. Right now, right at this moment, she's feeling them. And she's trying to educate you. In fact, she created, out of her love, a myriad of laws to educate your soul, to bring her, you closer to her. This thing called the law of attraction, that was one of her creations. The law of cause and effect, the law of compensation, the law of divine love, all of these different laws, God created just for the benefit of your soul. No other reason. There, there are, in fact, a whole group of laws that only affect the human soul. They don't affect any other being in the universe other than a human, the human soul. Don't affect anything else. Does that make sense? So, for example, the law of compensation. That's a law that doesn't affect any other being in the universe, in the universe other than a human soul. God created that law specifically for you to come to know love. That one law. The law of attraction is a different kind of a law, right? in that there are all forms of attractions that happen and there are all forms of natural things that are attracted to each other. Like north and south poles of a magnet, magnet for example, creates an attraction. Well, that's a law that doesn't just affect the human soul. But there's a whole group of laws that only affect the human soul. And God created all those laws because she loves you. There's a whole group of laws, actually, that allow you to grow infinitely and create as you go. There's a whole group of laws that do that. So, so you can create new dimensions, actually. Whole universes your soul is capable of creating. Whole universes of things as your soul grows. Right? And it's a fact of life, but not, not many people on the planet are aware of, but Plenty of spirits are completely aware of that. So God has already put into place all of these things to, to know you. She has made an entire universe about you. So you think about it. Every single thing in the universe is your playground. It's your sensory playground. And then what she did on top of that is she created two bodies that a half of the soul could actually experience itself in until it gets to be complete again. And these two bodies are sensory apparatus. They are actually built for feeling. They're built for the absorption of things occur occurring in the universe to enter your soul. So the physical apparatus, for example. How many senses do you have in the physical apparatus? We often say well, it's five senses. But the physical apparatus is capable of so many different feelings, really, isn't it? Through those sensory apparatus, through this sensory input that occurs. So you can actually enjoy a sexual relationship, for example, because of the apparatus of your body. Right? It's an interface God created so that you can actually connect with another person and enjoy that connection. Does that make sense? There's the sense of touch where somebody can stroke your back and you feel tingling sensations all over your body. And that's part of this sensory apparatus of your body. The sense of sight, where you can see colour and see all different visible forms of the light spectrum in this body, but in the next body you have, the spirit body, you can actually see a wider variety of the spectrum. Right? And then in the soul you can see the complete spectrum of infrared, ultraviolet, all of the spectrum. Right? And God's given you this ability to slowly grow into these abilities that you have. Then on top of that, if you look at the body and the way it functions, it's given you the ability to change and grow. And you can actually change yourself. You can eat a lot of food, for example, and get big. You can change yourself. And then you can stop eating so much food and eat better food and, and, and deal with some emotions about why you ate that kind of food and get slim again. And your whole body will just go back to a lot of times even better than how it was sometimes. Right? This is how your body is created. 
God also gave you the ability to heal it, to heal your own body. These are all parts of her expression of love to you. Right? And this beautiful sensory apparatus that you've been placed in has the ability to also now be sensitive to everything outside of itself. Other people who, are, who have their own sensory apparatus or other things. God created all these different beings for your enjoyment even. So what do you feel when you see an eagle flying and soaring? What do you feel when you see a whale out in the ocean? What do you feel when you see a dolphin jumping in front of your yacht? You know, what are the things you feel? These are all things that God created for you to feel and get to know her with. She has put everything in place for a relationship between you and her. Everything. Isn't that a beautiful parent? Everything's in place. Linda, thanks if we come. Thank you. Um, so, AJ, as a child, do we know um, and understand God? As a but child? Lose it? Yeah, because. Unfortunately, not. Like, let's think, let's think about what happens at incarnation. At incarnation, you could say, I don't know myself yet, and I don't know my own feelings yet, and I don't know my own emotions yet, I don't know how to exercise my free will because I've yet to experience life. At the moment of incarnation, where do I enter? I enter the womb of my mother. At that, at that moment, what am I absorbing? I'm absorbing all of my mother's emotions about God, all of my mother's emotions about like, and my father's eventually, as, as I grow, I'm absorbing his emotions too. So mum and dad's emotions are now being absorbed into me. I'm absorbing all of these belief systems that mum have, all of these. So do I really know that God's like this? Does she know? No, she I, doesn't. I feel like I've been grieving the loss of God, like I felt like I knew God as a child. But yep. Well, the truth is tough. that most of us have huge amounts of grief about our relationship with God. God did do something for you, though. God placed in your soul this little spark. And I don't call it a divine spark. because The only time a divine spark enters you is when divine love enters you. But it's this spark of wanting to know everything about yourself and everything about who created you. And that spark has been suppressed and suppressed and suppressed over generations of time. So much so that many of us now don't even believe in God at all. Right? We don't even want to think that God exists even. But the truth is inside of us, there is this spark that you're feeling a bit about. But a lot of the emotion you're feeling right now is your parents' emotion of loss about a relationship with God, not having one. Feeling something outside. We see, we all feel something is outside of us, but we don't know how to connect to it. So there's going to be a feeling of loss associated with that. Yeah. But the truth is, at the beginning of any, our incarnation, we are not aware of God. We're not self-aware of God. That develops in us due to this spark that God has placed in us. And it's exactly the same kind of spark that God has placed in us towards our soulmate. God also has that in play. So what it feels like inside of yourself is that when God enters you, when God's love enters you, for the first time in your life, you feel satisfied about this whole being met. Does that make sense? And when you, the love of your soulmate enters you, you'll, for the second time of your life, feel another hole being met. Does that make sense? Because there are these two va vacant areas, if you like, inside of your soul ready to be met by only one being. But what we finish up doing with, as humans with that is we finish up chasing other ways to meet that hole. So a lot of us, you know, chase sex or we chase alcohol, we chase drugs, we chase all sorts of things, chasing something. In reality, all we're doing is actually trying to fill the hole that we have with God with something else. Most of the time that's what we're doing. And the same applies to our relationship with our soulmate. Often we'll be trying, chasing a person or chasing individuals and again, often chasing sex and other things like that. Uh, to feel, feel a whole of a fulfilling relationship with our soulmate. So the truth is in our soul there is a recognition that these two things can be developed and there is a spark of both of them inside of us. And it's that spark even for six fear spirits that eventually get a six fear spirit off the natural love path and onto a divine love path when you actually talk to them about uh, have you noticed this feeling of dissatisfaction that's still there present in you? 
And the truth is that this feeling of dissatisfaction will be present in, to, in us until we have that relationship. It will remain. The feeling of dissatisfaction in a human relationship towards our partner will remain until we have a soulmate relationship. Right? And the feeling of dissatisfaction towards God will remain until the relationship with God is fulfilled. So that is tr very true. But the grief you're feeling is related to your parents' grief. Does that make sense? Because you wouldn't feel grief about it if you knew it was available to you. Do you understand? It just feels like I had it and then I lost it because of just my environment. And yeah, but that's, that's your parents' grief about the loss of love. And all of the human God. race have huge amounts of emotions about the loss of love in their life. From God. Not just from it's, God. So from just love in general. It's love in general. Love from God. everyone. Yeah. We, we arrive into a almost, what well, in comparison, compared to where we're going to go, we arrive in almost a loveless society. We, we arrive in a very codependent, addictive, loveless society. And, and it's very, very hard to cope with emotionally, isn't it? Have you found this easy process of arriving in this place? <laughs> I don't know about that. I haven't found it that easy myself, you know. Like. But what I'm trying to illustrate to you is that God has put everything in place for this relationship to occur. She has already made it. Everything available to you to have this relationship with her. Does that make sense? But, you know, one of my blockages towards God is going to be that I don't believe God's done that? You see, if I don't believe God's done that, how am I ever going to trust that God's done that? Like, it's very difficult, isn't it? If I don't have faith that God has done that, then why would I want a relationship with somebody who I don't believe has done it? And this is the same on the earth, if you think about it. Why would I, often what we're doing in our relationships on earth is we're waiting for another person to love us before we will love. Have you noticed that inside of yourself? You're so scared about loving someone because you might get rejected that you wait to be loved yourself until, and when you are loved yourself, then you'll love them. Right? And this is often what we do. But God has already put that in place too. God's already loved us before we even loved God. God makes the sun shine upon, as the Bible says, the good and the bad. In other words, God has loved what we classify as good people as much as God has loved the bad people. That's the extent of God's love. That's what God does. So she's got everything in place, everything in place to have this beautiful relationship with you. Everything. It's absolutely everything in place. But what isn't in place from your perspective? Can you see? Can you see it's all about us really, what we are doing? So let's look at what we're doing. Do we even want to know her? How much of our life do we spend desiring to know God? Now we, we often say we want to. But I mean, I, mean, I mean in our day-to-day -day interaction, do we find ourselves looking at things and relating that to our relationship with God? Or do we just use that thing? Most of the time, with a lot of different aspects of our life, we don't give much consideration to God. I like, I like a nice quote in the uh, Conversations with God series of books where, where he's saying, Neil Donald Walsh is saying to God, but I've longed for you for years and years and I've never felt you. And, and, and God says back... Um, and by the way, it's the second spirit that says back, but anyway. Um, <laughs> and God says back, God says back, well, that actually, if you add up all the time that you did that, it was actually 48 hours or 46 hours. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, of all of that 30 or 40 years that the person said, well, the real time it was was only a few hours in reality. And if we're honest with ourselves, most of the time, we feel some kind of longing, this hole in ourselves for God, but we feel so frustrated that it's not being fulfilled that we give up on the longing for it. 
and that's often what happens. And it's only in times of dire need or deep regret or sadness that we finish up re-establishing that desire. The rest of the time we try to ignore it because it feels too painful to feel. That's what we think. So what we need to learn to do is have a, firstly, desire to know God. So let's write that down. We need to desire. God already desire, knows us. To have a relationship with God, we need to desire to know God. We need to desire to feel. And how do we know someone? Remember I said that? It was by feeling them. Right? So, so let's be more specific. We need to have a desire to feel God's feelings. And this is where we start seeing the problem, can't we? How can we feel the feelings of someone else when we can't feel our own? That's a bit difficult, isn't it? So, so can you see the importance of feeling your own feelings? Because how can I feel God's feelings and emotions if I can't feel my own feelings and emotions? So the beauty of establishing this desire for God and desire to feel God is in the process I will come to feel myself completely. That's the beauty of it. It's going to open me up to all of my own feelings right, and emotions automatically as I am coming to feel God. Can you feel God yet? Now, for many of us what happens is that there's times when we feel God. You notice that? When you become at one with God, that is when you'll be able to feel God and you will be feeling God constantly. You'll feel God so much that you'll come to every situation and you'll feel how God would act in this situation, how God feels about this situation. And obviously if I come to a situation I have judgment, I'm no longer feeling how God feels because does God have judgment? No. If, if I come to a situation I have anger, I'm no longer feeling what God's feeling because does God have anger? No. If I come to a situation I'm feeling humiliated or shamed or any of these other feelings, does God have any of those feelings? No. So I'm no longer feeling what God feels. Once I've developed emotionally and I release those emotions, I will actually be able to feel what God would do in every situation too. Isn't it, wouldn't that be just a fantastic thing to do? Like, to actually be walking on the earth and feeling every other person that's on the planet and at the same time feeling their emotions and feelings and knowing what to do because you can feel what God would do. That's what it's like being at one with God. You can feel what God would do in every situation. That would be an amazing place, wouldn't it? You don't have to worry about planning anything anymore, do you? In that place. Because all you do is you just swing along in life and when the situation comes up, it's just, I know exactly what to do now. I'm exactly. It's, like, it's not like I used to be in my life where I'd get out pieces of paper and I'd write down all the different things that I had to do tomorrow and then, and then I'd write down all the different things that might go wrong tomorrow and then I'd write down, okay, what will I do about all the things that might go wrong tomorrow? And, and so it's not like that anymore. Right? What, what it's like is you just waltz through without even thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow. Because you don't even need to think about it anymore. You know that this relationship, you know what to do in every situation, so why would you worry about any situation? <laughs> All you do now is act upon desire, act upon desire every time. And if my desire to feel and know God is paramount, then every other desire will be activated as a result. Right. So, so while God has a burning desire for me, the question really becomes, do I have a burning desire for God? Can you see that? That's really what's going to establish this relationship. God already wants one with me. God already has all of the things in play, all of this sensory apparatus to feel everything, all of the soul-based apparatus to actually deal with any 
emotion, whether it be positive or negative. We have all of these things in play. God's made everything perfectly for us to be in this zone where we actually can have a relationship with God 100% of the time, all of the rest of our lives continually growing. God's already placed all that into our life as a part of our life. And all it needs is for us to make one decision. And that is to have a burning desire for God. That's all it needs. Now that being the case, we really need to look at how to develop a burning desire, don't we? Like if that's the only thing that is going to bring about all of these results that we've been talking about, then we really need to look at what a burning desire is and what, what we would define a burning desire to be. So what would you define a burning desire to be? Now, how about this? There's, a, there's a, another verse in the Bible, and sorry for those of you that are a bit triggered about me quoting the Bible today, but that's an emotion too that you need to allow yourself to feel. There's another a verse in the Bible. The Apostle John uh, channeled some information uh, on the spirit world, um, but way, way, way back in the first century, and a lot of it got very distorted, by the way, so don't think the book of Revelation is John's channeling as he channeled it in the first century. But the information that was channeled, one part of it was about the emotions of people on the earth. And one of, the, one of it says this, um, that many of us have a lukewarm attitude to God. And you know what it's like when you get a cup of tea, right? Or a cup of coffee, right? You go down, you go down the shop, you make all the effort to go down there, you sit down and you order your cuppa and you get it and you take a zip and it's insipidly like cool, coolish warm. What do you feel like doing with that? It's like, oh, there's a lot of disappointed feelings in that, isn't there, generally? And you feel like taking back, can I have that a bit hotter? And Mary and I now, whenever we ask for a cuppa, it's, we, we ask for, can you make it very hot, please? Because <laughs> most of the time it's not made hot at all. And, um, and isn't the opposite of the case? You, you, let's say you're outside working in a hot day, you know, and you've been sweating heaps and you're outside chipping away with the, with the um, pick or something like that and sweat's pouring off you and somebody brings out a, a bottle of water for you. You open the lid and start guzzling it down and it's actually warm. <laughs> How does that feel? Do you? The same? It's not freezing cold, is it? Like it, it doesn't have this contrast. It doesn't appeal to us. Well, the truth is that God has this feeling in her soul that always responds to passion. Mm -hmm. To something being definitely that thing not just insipidly that thing. Right? And God responds, of course, to truth as well. Not to um, facade. Making out things are what they are. Well, you consider, do you respond to that very well? Well, that's not true, you see. Most of the time we do respond to that quite well. You see, when somebody comes up and says, oh, you're such a lovely person, we go, oh, such a lovely person. <laughs> You know, and they go, and they go um, can, I, can I get you to do this? No worries, thanks for saying such a lovely person. And in reality, they didn't think they were a lovely person, they just wanted us to do that thing that they just asked for. That happens how many times in our life? Where we're, giving, we're given a compliment, which is really, what do they call it? Manipulation. Well, it is really manipulation, but uh, there is a word. Flattery. 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 And flat, what, is, what is the purpose of flattery? To make you feel good so that something comes from you in the end, generally. Right? Isn't it not? So, and, and God's not respond, does not respond to flattery. Right? So, and God also doesn't respond to self-flattery. Where I actually have an image of myself that's not accurate. Can you see why? Why would God respond to that? It's like me saying to God, oh, and this is what happened in the first century. You'd go along, you'd walk along the road, like, and uh, you'd be just walking along talking with friends. And on the corner, 
there'd be a Pharisee kneeling with his hands on the ground and his eye like all spread like that. There'd be tears running down his eyes. He's saying, he's saying all these things to God about how wonderful God is. And, whatever. and, then, and then when nobody's looking, he gets up and walks off. Right? And, and in the first century I said, they are like whitewashed graves. On the outside, they look all pretty and clean, but on the inside, they're dead men's bones. Now, of course, the Pharisees weren't too impressed with that description of themselves, <laughs> but it was the truth, right? And to be frank, a lot of the times we're like that. We like things to appear to other people and even appear to ourselves as if they're purely motivated. But in reality, a lot of times we aren't purely motivated at all. We have a lot of impure, addictive emotions driving our motivations. Right? Now, God can see everything inside of me. Now, now, when I first said that, many of you have had the feeling, isn't that wonderful, that God already knows you? But now let's just reflect for a moment. God knows exactly when you lied and why you lied and how you lied and what damage that did to every single person around you, whether they knew it or not. God also saw the damage in your soul about that. God also noticed when you were angry and what happened there and why you were angry and where you were angry and how you were angry and how that damaged all the different people. Now we're starting to go, oh, I don't know if I really want to be known by God so much if God knows all those things about me. But isn't that a bit of an advantage in your relationship with God? Like if you think about it, that allows you to be completely open and truthful on every issue with God. You can be open about your most darkest, darkest desires. Like last week I had this desire, I just wanted to kill that person. I just wanted to kill it, you know. And God allows you to be open with that desire with her because she already sees it in you. And all she's waiting for is you to recognize it in yourself. And when you can establish some truth in that relationship, now God can work with that. Right? So God is, is like this being who's totally like extra vision into your soul. And God sees everything, every causal emotion, every reason why something has happened inside of you, every dark desire you have, every desire you have that actually is damaging to other people, everything. And you're there going, I don't have any of these things, God. Why aren't you giving me your love? <laughs> do, you, do you see often what we're doing? Often what we're doing is we're just trying to maintain a fiction with God. Now, does, that, does when anybody tries to, make it, to maintain a fiction with you, do you feel attracted to that? Particularly if you know about it, do you feel attracted to it? See, oftentimes we're attracted to it until we know about it. And once we know about it, we go, whoa. That person's like just been playing me the entire time. That doesn't feel very good, does it? Well, you can't play God in the sense that you can't you know, force God to see you fakely or see your facade only. You have to be real with God, emotionally real with God. You see, so, so what happens is, is when I desire to feel God, I'm automatically starting to get confronted now about all of these protections that I've placed around myself to avoid God's love coming into me. And this is why your emotional work is important because anything that you have inside of your soul is going to prevent God's love from flowing into your soul. Not because God doesn't want to love you, but because of the blockages you have to having that love flow. And you lying to yourself is a blockage. Does that make sense? If you speak the untruth to yourself, you will be blocked towards feeling God's emotions. You'll even, you're even blocked towards feeling your own emotions, if you think about it. Why would I ever want to lie to myself? It's to make myself feel good. Why would I make myself feel good? Because I actually feel bad about that subject. And I don't want to feel it. So what am I doing? I'm suppressing how I feel about myself while I'm suppressing how I feel about myself. Can I feel God? Of course not. God can only enter someone who feels for, feels them, is willing to feel themselves. So what we're going to do, we'll ha probably have a break now, I think. 
And what we'll do is we'll talk more about how we can develop a burning desire for God, so much so that this desire becomes our primary focus in our life. So it's not, not something that's, that we just take for granted and we, you know, like the average thing that most people on the planet do with religion is what? They practice it one day a week. So in other words, one seventh of a desire for God. Right? So it's like, it's like pouring in a boiling water, one seventh of the cup, and then pouring in for the other six sevenths the cold water and say, here's your cu hot cup of coffee. Right? And it doesn't work and it's not going to work in your relationship with God either. What is going to work in your relationship with God is for you to have a burning desire and passion for God and for God's love to enter you. So we'll talk about developing that, how we go about developing that when we have a break, after the break. Okay?